Hello and welcome to Epicenter. No ambiguity, no noise. Let's come straight to the point. What do you think is the most powerful weapon available to nations? Strong, well-equipped military, youthful, fit demographics, natural resources, strong economy. Some of you might give these answers. All this is undoubtedly very important, but most important, is the art of storytelling. You and I tell stories about ourselves. Nations also tell a story. Nations also must tell a story about themselves. This story is called narrative. The narrative that countries tell about themselves, how they tell it and how convincing they are, determines the place of that country on the global table. Think about phrases like, leader of the free world, the land of the free and home of the brave, mother of all parliaments. What images do they conjure in your mind? Who puts these images and phrases in your mind? Who put these images and phrases in your mind space in the first place? Why were these stories told? Who is behind this story? Is it easy to tell your story? What tools can you use to tell your story? And how will you make those stories convincing? These are all important facets of statecraft, and this is what we will talk about today with our esteemed guest. It is my absolute privilege and honor to welcome Mr. Vikram Sood to Epicenter. Vikram Sood was a career intelligence officer for 31 years, and he retired in 2003 after heading India's external intelligence service, the research and analysis wing, commonly known as RNAW. Mr. Sooth has been writing regularly for the last decade or so on security, foreign relations, and strategic issues in journals and newspapers. He has contributed chapters related to security, China, intelligence, and India's neighborhood in various books published in last few years. Mr. Sooth's latest book, the book that we are going to talk about today, The Ultimate Goal, a former RNAW chief just deconstructs how nations construct narratives. You can see the book and its cover on your screen right now. This book, for lack of a better word, is a stunning eye opener. In the ultimate goal, Vikram Sood explains the narrative and how a country's ability to construct, sustain, and control narratives at home and abroad enhances its strength and position. You may or may not know it, but intelligence agencies invariably play a critical role in deciding this narrative. This is often indispensable tool of statecraft. Welcome to the show, Mr. Sood. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. having me. This is wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much for being on Epicenter. This is wonderful. I'm looking forward to our conversation. But um, Mr. Sood, I have a bone to pick with you. Before we get into what is the nitty gritty of the discussion, the serious side of it, on a lighter note, I have to tell you that um, I think before reading this book, I was myself a victim of Hindi cinema's narrative. I used to think all former spy masters do stunts like Salman Khan. I didn't know they were into writing fascinated bestsellers that change the world of worldview of people like you've done. <laughs> <laughs> so no stunts for you like Mr. Salman <laughs> but yeah that is the power of narrative as well I mean people to yes. like you also yes. 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 yeah go ahead no I said that's how they sold the story about how how good intelligence agencies are and what what kind of things they are capable of glamorizing the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> but it isn't so at all it's not glamorous like that no, not at all, not at all. And um, uh, if I may say, the spies need to be boring so that nobody notices them. Yeah, yeah, that is that is that is the uh, that is the ultimate uh, way of doing things. Right, right. If you want to get noticed, then you're not a spy. <laughs> exactly, and you don't you don't need to be. So James Bond is only here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> indeed. 
Um, Mrs. Sooth, getting to the book. A lot of people have said brilliant things about your book. The reviews are fabulous, as fabulous as the book is. Um, but I have to tell you my personal experience. I think your book changed my thought process forever. I am someone who you well know is well entrenched into the world of news and views. I understand propaganda narratives. I'm, you know, I, I see it closely. I knew most of the episodes that were mentioned in the book. Yet, even in my mind, I had not been able to put them together and connect them in a thread like you did. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the strength of the book. You put it together so beautifully and suddenly it opens up our mind. Why did you want to write a book on narratives? Why was it important to you? Actually, when I was when I was uh, working in the Way back in the 19, early, I think 1980, I remember the um, Iraq war was about to break out. I mean, right. people were talking about Iraq, Iran, and the Americans were very unhappy about the 79 Islamic revolution in, in uh, Iran, and they wanted to get their own back. They, they had fear, they had hostages in, in, in Iran. So there was a game being played, and uh, as a young officer, I was watching this. That uh, you know, a lot of uh, talk about how good Saddam was, and how mm -hmm. magnificent he was, how tough he was, and uh, secular image. It's, you know, that kind of build up of Saddam. Right. And then uh, there was also discussion in one of the think tanks, well attended in uh, London, what would happen if Iran and Iraq went to war? Mm. And uh, one listened to it and uh, the conclusion was that perhaps Iraq would win. Okay. Wow. And a week later, Saddam attacked Iran or 10 days. Yeah. So, you know, you, you get the feeling, is that a coincidence? Is that a Pre, you know, pre-planned thing. Did they have some information we didn't have? And then, subsequently, we watched. I watched other events taking place. There would be a storyline. There would action. What happen after that? Now, it couldn't be that uh, newspapers and journals have all the information in advance, and the intelligence agencies don't yeah. know. But this was actually being put out by people who wanted things to happen in a particular way. Or you know, when later on it, it was quite obvious when, uh, um, when when the Americans were playing into the game of WMDs in Iraq, oh, yeah. that narrative. So that was the, those were the short-term, single-pointed agendas that uh, for this, to do this, we have to create the atmosphere, the mahal, the, the yeah. acceptance of the, that mm. this is we're going to do a good deed mm. for the world, we'll save the world. And so that's how it would happen. Yeah. So before, even before that, remember, uh, when was it? When uh, Saddam attacked, that was after this, when Saddam attacked Kuwait. Right, right. That was there, the start of the Gulf War. That was, there was also a build up to that. And, right. and, and the, the American ambassador met Saddam Hussein and said, we have no view on this situation, meaning thereby that if you attack Kuwait, it's okay. Mm -hmm. The actual purpose was... The book. I remember clearly, you mentioned that in the book, that yeah. the ambassador met uh, Saddam Hussein, U.S. ambassador, yeah. and said, it's okay, yeah. we'll look the other yeah. way. And Fine, we don't mind. We don't mind. It's an Arab thing. Actually, they wanted the Saudis to get scared. Mm -hmm. Then the Saudis asked for American presence in, in Saudi. Yeah. That's what they wanted. And that's yeah. what they got. That's what they got. Yeah. So that's how narratives are used to build your strategic strengths, your, yeah. your, um, your ability to shape events. Yeah. That's how it, it's, it starts. It's, it's stunning. So what we see and what we eventually get or what we in our mind think would be uh, 
uh, you know, a suitable conclusion or this is how this will end or winners or losers in a war. All that definition has changed because as you mentioned, even in this, uh, the US, there was, it, when it went into Gulf, they wanted Saudis to ask for the presence, United States presence. Right. So that was the ultimate goal. This everything else, we kept thinking who's going to win and who is going to lose. All that is, that no, doesn't make sense. That was the goal. The goal was Saudi Arabia. Yeah, goal was Saudi Arabia. That's that's what you talk about. And that's why your book is so beautifully, um, I think, titled also, The Ultimate Goal. The ultimate goal for nations is that their story becomes the global story. And yeah. now I, sitting in India, am also parroting what has been set in Pentagon, what has been sent to the CIA headquarters. And I parrot it in a way like it's my own thing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Look, look at how the global war on terror took off. Yeah. You know, throughout the 90s, we had terror in India, mm. sponsored by Pakistan, and Kashmir was in a mess. You know, you know that best. I don't have to repeat all that. But we were being charged with human rights violations in Kashmir. Yeah. There was no allegation, no condemnation of what the Pakistanis were doing. Yeah. Then 9-11 happened mm. and suddenly the terror became the biggest threat on earth. Yeah. And even the, even the French who were, who were very skeptical about, skeptical about the whole thing said, just so America, that I'm also America today. Yeah. And yeah. we of course felt that. Everybody, way. I remember I was a student, I was a young student in the United States at that time when 9-11 happened. And even then, I remember the television, the CNN, um, the headlines were the world is the free world is attacked. And yes. uh, it was not America's attack. It was free no. world is attacked. That's free that's world that's under attack. The no. So it was as if it was everybody's war. And I am standing there thinking to myself, well, free India has been under attack by the same people for if if not 1947 but at least since 1990 i mean we had dealt with um mm -hmm. terrorism in kashmir and khalistan so even if we don't talk about 1947 let's not talk about that even in the current avatar of terrorism which we saw in 1989 onwards we had already seen it so when attacks happen in india they're not attacks on free world but when attacks happen on america then suddenly it is the free world and then suddenly yeah. CNN at that point was rallying countries on on screen. I mean, live. CNN was rallying countries about who is going to support America now in this war of terror. And they're doing this all online and everything yeah. is happening, uh, this thing, the world is under. And here I am thinking that I come from the other side of the globe. My house was attacked. We were, we, my country has been dealing, my government has been dealing with terrorism for so long. How come we were never able to convince you then about Islamist yeah. Jihad? So, um, so I guess these are all different things. We will come to this. We will come to Pakistan and we will come to Kashmir and we'll come to India. Those are all very important topics of our discussion. And you mentioned them very clearly in the book. But going back to uh, the beginning of your book, where you talk about, you very clearly said that in hundred, you mostly were going to talk about the hundred, last 150 years or so of narrative setting in the global arena. And those most, that 150 years has been dominated by uh, Anglo-American um, sphere. So first Britain and British Empire, so to speak, and then America, of course, after 1945. So we know that there was a time when colonialism was good for the colonies. We were supposed to like colonialism. We were supposed to like what they were doing to us. We were supposed to like the train service and the postal service they were bringing to us, not realizing that um, you know they were looting us and they were using our money to bring us this development. They were not doing us a favor. So that was one narrative. Then the narrative shifts in 1945. America is the winner of the war. And now Britain is on decline. America is rising. Yes, America was on the winning side. But what contributed 
to that image of land of the free home of the brave this is the world of uh, this is the leader of the free world what was the mindset with that and if you look at the narrative how quickly they succeeded also it takes it usually takes a while for uh, even for britain it took about 100 years for them to get where they did at the peak of their empire but for america it didn't take a whole lot, long time at all how did they how did they do this you know uh, soon after the war ended mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the americans realized that unless they keep the soviet union down mm -hmm. that would be part of being the superpower yeah so this the attempt was straight away to use all means available for communication to sell this image mm. that we are the best as a young boy when you read comics it was roy rogers and hopper long cassidy who were going to support the cowboys against the evil indians and that how uh, a poor white woman would be rescued by the U.S. cavalry. So we, we all thought that was the real life. That's yeah. what we grew up with. But the advantage that the United States had, and he used it cleverly, actually started earlier in the 1920s, when they formed organizations like the Council on Foreign Relations. Mm. Massive highly respectable, well endowed, all the best brains and the must, best money was available, politicians were available. So it became a kind of a noble think tank to keep America ahead of everybody. Remember, even in 1812, the US president then said, what a power shall we be? So it goes back to the 19th, early 19th century, about 35 years or 40 years after the independence that the Americans were talking about becoming a superpower. Mm -hmm. Then they had Hollywood. Yeah. I think Hollywood has done so much for the US, uh, US Western culture, US supremacy, the goodness, nobility of US, yeah. bravery of their soldiers. I mean, even even a lost war is made as a noble thing. Yeah, yeah. Hope down was a failure, but they have made it look like a winner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, in your book, you have a whole chapter dedicated to Hollywood, yeah. and it stunned me that Hollywood actually was pretty much run by CIA and yeah. <laughs> Pentagon. Pentagon. And we would have never known. And you said, and it wasn't like it was hidden also in that sense, because the CIA actually had a liaison officer. Yeah. And there was this person who was, and you very beautifully in your book mentioned that, yes, they vetted the scripts, they looked at the scripts, but there must have also been scripts that didn't see the light of the day. The yeah. other thing also happened. But it is amazing. Before America, did no one realize the power of cinema? or the power of mass media? I don't think so. The mass media actually came much after the Second World. You know, the radio, I mean, when TV took on. Yeah, but printing press had come. Printing press had already come. Yeah. Yeah. The radio was there, but this thing really took off after the Second World War. Yeah. Globally. Globally. And uh, we, of course, got in 62, and we never bothered about the... the, the um, the utility that Bollywood would, would provide to us. We, yeah. we just let it run amok. Yeah. And, use. and, and um, you know, this requires a street, strategic, strategic thinking. Yeah. That you must think ahead 30, 40 years. What do you want to be and how do you get there? Mm. What do you need to do? Is, is, as you mentioned earlier, that money, weapons, are away but that's not the only thing you have to tell your story yeah and our problem has been we've never been able to tell our story mm -hmm. we've always told our story their way yeah and we've said we've told our story their way very happily very admiringly mm. as i told you we almost made their story our own story huh? and we were very happy 
I'm very happy to join that. Also, I think we also had, it's we are getting rid of that, the the desire to look good in the West. Yeah. Seeking approbation of the West all the time. Getting very nervous if the New York Times or somebody else writes a bad piece about us. They write bad pieces about their own country too, but they 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 may have they may have an agenda about us. So the answer to that agenda is not whining and replying to them. Let the Ministry of External Affairs and whoever do it. But for Indians, we have to build our own systems. Yeah. If they talk about poverty in India, you think there's no poverty in the United States? Of course. Yeah. We don't get to see it. We don't get to hear it. Nobody talks about it. The entire Ukraine exercise operation since February has been portrayed in Indian newspapers through Western channels. Yeah. It's Reuters, uh, it is CBS, it is uh, CNN, AFP. Where is our voice? What do we say? Where is the Russian voice? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. So we've got that impression. Whatever they say, that's that's the truth. Yeah. We accept it. There is also about the news. In all these years, the three major mega news uh, agencies, Reuters, which was earlier in uh, United Kingdom and now is owned by New York, is in New York, is owned by um, uh, United States. So there is Reuters and there's AFP and there is AP. Other than that, in last almost 60 years, nothing has come up. How can nothing come up? Is it because nobody's allowing it to come up? After all, um, uh, China has been a big, we'll come to China also, um, but why has China not been able to enter the news business? Tell, I tell you something, the Chinese have done something much smarter. I, I got to know after I'd written my book, otherwise I would have put it okay. there. Uh, in 2008, you had the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. We had the 2611 crisis. Yeah. The Chinese moved into Hollywood. Yeah. They sent a group of, you know, artists from the industry to learn from the Americans how it is done. So, Paramount, Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Mm -hmm. and Columbia, whoever, they actually held sessions to teach them how to organize the film industry. Wow. At that time, it was a 500 million industry for, for, for the Americans. Yeah. In 10 years, the Chinese were ruling Hollywood. You know, you can't do... You, you must have heard of that, the Top Gun movie? Yes, of course. Where where this chap wears these three emblems at the yes. back of the neck. Yes, absolutely. Which has Japan, uh, Taiwan, and something else. Yeah. The flag. Yeah, yeah. The hero. In Top Gun Maverick, mm -hmm. they removed those emblems. Ah. Oh. That is the power of the narrative. Yeah. Chinese have made the Americans not use that because they would lose business. Yeah. Why didn't we do something like this? Yeah. Never thought of it. Never it thought just of it. Money. And they have deep pockets and they have they have the ability of or the facility of doing thinking long term. Yeah. Yeah. So does America. They, 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 you might say the Democrats are pro this or pro that, but the total goal is the same. Yeah, the strategic for a long time, uh, we have always worried that India doesn't have India thinks about we've had these five year plans and Pansala plan and everything for uh, security may strategic doctrine for the longest time. No, yeah. we don't have that, you know, and when yeah. you have prime ministers changing every two years in a country. Mm. From yeah. 1990 to 2001, uh, 99, where do you get continuity? Right. 
particularly in a democratic setup like ours. Yeah. Coalition government. So we have our own problems as well as the lack of uh, long term thinking. Yeah, yeah. Traditionally, we have not had that. We have not had that. The way way we are. Also, not a sense of having, knowing our enemy. That is also a very important thing. Shatru Bhav Hona Bhi has been, you know, even our scriptures talk about Shatru Bhav Hona. So, we have thought of Pakistan as our traditional enemy, not understanding that Pakistan will never have the resources or things to uh, get to us but it satisfies our inner urge because you know after 1947 and all that you know the country was divided you know, but it satisfies our inner urge to fight them so we will do the cricket match thing and we will do all this um, stuff but we have not even understood it's very late now that we understood who our real enemy is yeah even after 1962 debacle Dar, dar ke we were talking about China. We never really said like America, America declares who its weapons um, enemies are. Like axis of evil is declared. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Everyone knows that you know from time to time they have been, it was Soviet Union, then once Soviet Union finished, Iran, then North Korea. Iran, and then you know now North Korea, you know. In India, we were very scared about even mentioning our enemy. Yeah. So we don't even have that sense also. So I will come back to India, China and Russia. That is all those questions I have for later. But I want to ask one last question about Western narrative. The Cold War. Uh, the Cold War was decisively, um, you know, won by the United States. At least that's what we think. And they had a wonderful turn till 2001, which is when Islam is attacked because they lived in this glory that we have won um, uh, Cold War. Cold War was cold in um, maybe in Soviet Union and uh, United States on the, in their own land, but it wasn't cold everywhere else. As we know in Afghanistan, it was a very hot war. So we know when it was fighting and we know that the remnants of that were in Kashmir and we know that Cold War became quite hot war, quite a hot war in Kashmir as well. So we know all that area. Cold War was also a war between CIA versus KGB. Yeah. And you mention in your thing, when you talk about Russian way, you talk about how good KGB was also at its peak. They also understood the problem, um, you know, the um, what propaganda can do. And they also had uh, they also had a sense of how to get into people's minds. Why is it that CIA won and KGB didn't? I think one of the problems that the KGB had was that um, that uh, language. Ah. You know, as US English was an all pervasive thing. Very important and point for us. Uh, those who those who were the opinion makers, etc., yeah. etc., were English speaking. Are English speaking still yeah. mostly? So that was the biggest advantage they had. Mm. Uh, Russia today is a new invention, but they speak in Americanized English. They have Americans doing that. Mm. But in the, in the Cold War days, it was, and it was very staid and very Russian. And, and, and you're right that the Cold War was cold only in Europe in the First World. In the rest yeah. of the Third World, it was a, it was a bloody war. It was a bloody war. Yeah. All over I Africa. Southeast Asia, they were yeah. Latin America, they were going around butchering. Yeah. I think that's when America understood during Cold War, I think, or um, they understood it in Second World War also, but in Cold War, they really understood that they need to take the war, they need to fight the war in on the other lands. They don't need they don't need yeah. war on their own lands. That, that was that was decided. That, that was decided. decided. They don't need the war. Europe and the first world will never fight a war on their soil. Yeah. Uh, this, this was the first world privilege. 
that we are going to use we are going to use our weapons but we will use the third world ke log we will use their um, people we will use their land we will use their natural resources we will use their thing and we will give our weapons but yes. and we will control the war but we will never be um, the boots on the ground is it's very rarely that uh, you know american uh, america would itself want, want a war on their own soil they That's they it. they went into iraq they went into vietnam then they went into afghanistan but not in the same way as they did in vietnam yeah and look what happened to them in afghanistan yeah and um, iraq also they went in and came out they didn't stay on there yeah so the the idea is that the third world it, it's an old imperial thing i mean we fought the war second world war and the first world war for europe and america and uh, britain not knowing why we were fighting that war yeah. yeah our soldiers died and we didn't even get to participate in the victory parade in champs elysees in 1945 yeah dunkirk the movie doesn't show an indian face yeah stunning really stunning and it were our our churchill never that. churchill never talked about the indian contribution in the second world war yeah not a word yeah yeah it's, it's... and he got the nobel prize for literature they couldn't give him for peace but they gave it for literature <laughs> <laughs> talking about a nobel prize and all these awards and all these things <clears throat> you know the ratings agencies and awards you know how they used to like us for a while now they keep downgrading uh, india forever i mean mm -hmm. india does not have a democracy apparently india doesn't have the freedom of the press apparently although the people who scream about freedom of the press they are the ones who have the most disproportionate uh, space in the biggest newspapers in india they're screaming about uh, lack of freedom of press in times of india times of india has a bigger circulation than the new york times but uh, they will still talk about uh, lack of freedom of press and all that so all these ratings agencies and all um, the agents um, you know these awards that they have given nobel prize and all this do you think these are also arms of yeah it's imperialism, a, american imperialism it's 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 a we all ch cherish these awards yeah we all look forward to the pulitzer prize the yeah. nobel prize the um, maxesse award that used to be there but the idea, idea is when did they give the dalai lama his holiness the nobel prize yeah Never soon thought. after i think to soon after uh tiananmen right and why did they give aung san suu kyi the award i don't dispute i'm not uh, downgrading the award no, no, not but, downgrading their contribution but the timing of it all the timing yeah, the timing yeah and mahatma gandhi the apostle of peace never got it <laughs> they didn't get a peace prize yeah Yeah. So they're 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 uh, political, uh, you These know. These are instruments. After all, after all, awards for for Nobel are decided in February of the year. Hmm. The announcement yeah. happened in June. Hmm. They gave him the award that year. Yeah. It's 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 a fascinating thing once you. Uh, Literature. You know, yeah. Award. Yeah. book a prize the people who write against you will get book book a prizes yeah because yeah. against us will appear in new york times and yeah, yeah. the standard uh, stock shots will appear there yeah yeah so it's it's and nowadays this entire thing about hindu hindutva yeah the hindu extremists there's a pattern to it mm. you watch it it's a pattern that they are creating Yeah. Let me. They don't yeah. Want to see two, they don't want to see two big economic powers in Asia. That is the real deal. Yep. That is the real deal. So now, now that you've talked about in the two economic powers, let's go to China first, and then we'll go to India. I want to spend some time on India and the narrative building there. 
my sense up until now has been and please correct me if you if you think i'm wrong my sense up until now has been that um, any country that is that does not give freedom to its own citizens and that does not um, give that space whatever america does outside of its shores we know it is not the most freedom loving country outside of its shores but inside the country there is uh, rule of law and everyone has equal rights there is you have to admit that there is some amount of freedom for people to speak in their daily lives and of course you don't have to be a snowden or a, a massage or everything but generally people yeah. if you're not getting into the way of cia if you're not getting into the way of uh, government or anything if you're leading your own life you have the permission to speak against the government you can talk about it so there is some limited amount some some freedom you know yeah. yeah. So if you're not going against the deep state, there's a lot of freedom in um, United States. And that is what they sell to the world. That is the idea, the American dream, a nice house with a backyard and a car in the front and economic freedom as well as freedom of speech. That is what they sell to the world. And freedom is a very intoxicating idea to human mind. It's, a, it's an extremely intoxicating idea. After all, who does not want to be free? And once you have, you can see right from Magna Carta, the minute, you know, the humanity has the civilizations have only moved towards more freedom and not less, because once you give freedom, you cannot take it back. So freedom is a very important uh, toxic. China does not give that to its people. China does not have the china hasn't been able to give that uh, american dream a there is no chinese dream nobody dreams a chinese dream because everybody knows that it is an oppressive society with that background how do you think i have a, I, my um, uh, thing is that china will never be able to take take you know, the place of united states somebody else will but probably china will not be but what is your opinion about it? Because I think, um, you know, this whole thing about a democracy versus authoritarian regime also, you know, you can talk a little bit about that also. I think my sense is China will not get there, even though people say that it will. What is your sense? With a couple of, let me start by, you know, when, when uh, let's go back to 1990, when the Soviet Union fell mm. and, uh, globalization and China began to emerge. Gorbachev's mistake was he gave political freedom before he gave economic freedoms. Right. And the Chinese did the reverse till date. Mm -hmm. They've given economic freedom up to a point, but they've not given any political freedom. Some say that this is that we shouldn't take too much. We shouldn't think that all Chinese want freedoms. That they want to be as 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 uh, as free as the Americans or even half as free as the Americans. The old Han tradition of whatever comes from Beijing, whatever comes in the center, is the is the final version. No questions asked. Mm. That mentality still continues in the majority of the Chinese. That's one view. I don't know whether that's that is the view, but that may explain the reason why they're able to make it last for so long. In the yeah. in the context of freedoms elsewhere, mm. the Chinese there is no sign of a Chinese revolt. Mm. There's no sign of a revolt like. What is what is going on in in Iran, for instance? Yeah. Or even in Pakistan now, nobody is coming out on the streets to to claim. Yeah. So they are they are a very strong monolithic, top down society. Mm. And freedoms are probably not the best thing that not the first thing that they want. Mm. If China collapses, it will collapse because of its own mistakes. It cannot be, it won't be conquered. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It may, it's too big. It's too big. It has the longest, largest land boundaries on earth with any country, 22,000 yeah. something kilometers. Yeah. The next is Soviet Union, Russia. 
so they they are they they are a big country mm. it if it collapses it will be call, an economic collapse mm. first but i don't see that happening soon mm. my fear is that you might see a decline in the power of the west such as it is there are certain things that they don't do very well they don't do particularly nicely but but surely they have as you say the, the freedoms the equality the the kind of equality they have the kind of freedom that nobody else can compare mm. and they they i mean if you're good at your work you you do go up and down yeah. so there's a lot to be said about the american uh, society mm. but they're not that at all they're not democrats outside yeah and they're also the most violent country remember internationally yeah they fought more wars they have invaded more countries than either china or russia yeah russia yeah. done one so far mm. they have fought the others that was the cold war period but this is the first one only country that dropped the atomic bomb a nuclear bomb yeah. <laughs> so they have they have a lot of firsts to them yeah and i think this globalization is going to hit back hmm it is it is going to similarly causing problems within the united states as far as i can remember yeah. if i if i read it right that uh, the the white worker is feeling deprived of his job because yeah. somebody in asia is working for him yeah and if the indians do the same thing and if manufacturing shifts to india mm -hmm. if if um, apple or somebody shifts from china to india it doesn't help the american yeah it helps the indian yeah so they they they're all worried if what the rising india if the third uh, fifth largest economy today third by ppp ratings Mm -hmm. is going to do the next 10 years yeah so but you know america portrays a benign narrative it is yeah. a benign narrative china doesn't believe in that no. uh, my sense is that a benign narrative ultimately works but do you think that's not right ultimately do you think some people might say uh, that it works know, longer let's say it, it works longer it works longer hmm. longer doesn't work because if you get wise to it then you understand what's going on yeah america works for its interests only yeah mm. and alliance with america but say between a smaller country and a big country is, is not an alliance no it's domination yeah yeah so a superpower will work for its superpower interests and they are superpower interests which are global yeah so he will be friendly with pakistan and in, in india like the chinese are trying to do with pakistan and other countries not so much with us yet yeah. mm -hmm. but the the superpower has to say that i a superpower is my friend mm -hmm. it's not actually the best thing to to really believe yeah yeah it's diplomatically correct it is necessary you must have friendly peaceful relations but ultimately it is their interest that will concern that will you must concern. also understand what price you are paying to keep that relation to keep that peaceful relationship alive so yeah. that is also very important because sometimes i think countries don't realize what price they are paying they there might be economic freedom or something maybe in um, uh, uh, you know uh, south korea but their culture is pretty much wiped out yeah yeah they they so, come down yeah. there's no a, american there. american colony you know in that yeah. sense they just don't know they just don't know i want to move to india now and in the beginning of your book i think it's just the first few pages you've said that the indian politics and the indian thing something i'm paraphrasing changed with two things one for 
genocide of Kashmiri pundits and how people were didn't accept it and continue to deny it till today. And Ram Janam Bhumi, um, you know, the, this whole struggle. You say that these two things change the polity of India, and we can see how it has changed it for um, things. So Kashmiri pundits may not have been the um, uh, uh, you know, they may not have been a voting blocker in the sense, but the fact that they are a vocal munch and their genocide keeps getting denied is also a blot on the secular image of India. So, and uh, the denial continually that happens from the liberal side and the left side of the spectrum, of the political spectrum, that has also changed it. My sense, my question to you now is a bigger question that we know that Pakistan is a failing country. I mean, ordinary people know it. We know that their economy for the longest time was sustained by being an ally to um, America, United States. And after that, you know, it is now we know what is they're almost a bankrupt country. Why is it that on Kashmir issue, India has never been able to set the narrative in the West? I mean, I can give you scores of examples. I can give you scores of examples where ISI has not won the battle with us, but has actually carried the day, if not the long term, but has carried the day. For example, on Article 370, the entire thing was that not nobody understood that it was a, um, a temporary thing. Nobody understood that it was a restriction. It was, and by removing Article 370, you were actually giving human rights and not curtailing them. Those things, those stories never come out for some reason. Why is it that India has on the global table, hasn't been able to tell the Kashmir story well? I think uh, we were on the wrong side during the Cold War. Uh, when, when the Kashmir issue was being churned up in the initial stages. Mm. And uh, that has... Um, colored the minds throughout that here is a small country and these Indians are denying uh, uh, freedoms to the Kashmiris. They're not only doing, carrying out the UN resolutions. Yeah. We never properly explained to them what the UN resolution said. Mm. Plebiscit was only the third stage. The first stage was that the Pakistanis have to vacate the territory. Second is that they, they will, we will hold the plebiscite, that Indians will retain the forces necessary to hold a plebiscite under Indian administration. Yeah. Yeah. But. Uh, third was the plebiscite. Then first, plebiscite. first two had to be fulfilled and then the third then, would come into being. Yeah. But they put it up as first and we never insisted that Karao. Yeah. Karao by plebiscite karao. Yeah. We are ready for it. Mm. Let there be a plebiscite. Pehle do karao. Pehle do karao because if you didn't understand that the Pakistanis are not going to vacate it, mm. then you are on the high high on high ground anyway. Yeah. No, when I was doing um, we were defensive. We have been, always been defensive in Kashmir. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why. Our story was a morally strong story. But we have not been able to sell it. Also, I think there was very poor receptivity of the story there. Okay. The, uh, I will believe a story that I want to believe because this is a story that I'm telling against their enemy. Yeah. I mean, against their friend. Friend. I'm telling a story when Pakistan is a member of Seattle, Centro, Baghdad, Pact, whatever. And, and contributing to their war against communism, contributing to their war against uh, in, in Afghanistan. And the amount of support they gave them with their bases in Pakistan to, to launch attacks into Afghanistan. These are all uh, uh, advantages that they got. Do you think that Osama bin Laden was really caught out the way they say he was caught out? <laughs> And do you think Zarka Zawahiri was shot while he was having tea in that balcony? <laughs> of course. Not. So these are these are things that are traded off. 
yeah. that makes a, a nation, uh, uh, you know, a reliable uh, asset yeah. to them. Yeah. How did uh, Kissinger land up in uh, China? Yeah. Via Pakistan. Yeah. So these yeah. are things that I owe you, Zunone, a lot of Yeah. We are seen to have done nothing except talk against them, vote against them in the UN, all issues. Mm. They've counted out how many times they voted against the American resolution and how many times they voted for the Russian and Soviet resolution. So they, they keep that in mind and pin you down on these kinds of things. Um, so I was doing this deposition in US Congress, as you know, in Tom Lantou's commission, and then one yeah. of people they were talking about um, a plebiscite. Always this thing comes up that there should be a plebiscite. And I told him, I said, you know, do you understand that Kashmir, I mean, even this, this so much lack of awareness, even with, um, you know, lawmakers who sort of, they sit on this, uh, these big, um, um, you know, um, agencies, and I mean, big, um, uh, they form these um, big groups, but somehow, a basic understanding that Kashmir now, I mean, after we changed 2019, we got uh, rid of uh, China is a hush hush out of this. Now China is not bordering Kashmir, it is bordering Ladakh. But at one point, if you look at it, uh, uh, I, I told them that Kashmir is now divided between three major countries. There's India, there is Pakistan, and there is China. A part of Kashmir is with China also, a part of Kashmir is with Pakistan, and a part of Kashmir is with India, and the part of Kashmir that is with uh, China and America is illegal. It was a, a China, yeah. Pakistan was an aggressor, and a part of China was illegally given to China. So I said, fine, do the plebiscite, but good luck getting China out of the way first. Good luck getting mm -hmm. Pakistan out of the way first. Why are you not talking about these things? A lot of people don't even understand that in 1947, the first thing that Pakistan as a newly made country did was launch Operation Gulmar and then yeah. attack India, attack Kashmir. That was the first thing they did. Like within months, within two months, they got the um, um, independence in August and in um, October is when the attack yeah, happened. They were there. Yeah. Yeah, so they were planning it along all along, and that is the first thing they did. Why is Pakistan is an aggressor? Why is this narrative not anywhere? I have not found it in one place till this now. Even now, after um, uh, seven or eight years of Modi government, where the narratives have, we've seen the narrative shift happening. Even now, you don't see that narrative that Pakistan is an aggressor in Kashmir, ever. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's that that is true, and uh, I was going to say something. Yeah, the, the uh, Pakistan has been shown as not been shown as an aggressor because it doesn't suit them to show us show yeah. it as an aggressor. It's it's all politics. It's not as if they don't understand what's going on. Largely, but yeah. if you expect. Uh, U.S. congressmen to know what the implications of Article 370 are. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. they don't know. They don't care. Okay. They don't care. Yeah. They've got this guy on their side. He's been helpful to them. Baki sab chodo. Uh -huh. They don't want India, India to become. You know the 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 the, 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 the strategy concept in US is let no regional power become so strong as to oppose their interests in that region. Mm. So if if we we win, if you if they support us, then, then this fellow goes down. Yeah. And we become more powerful in the region. Yeah. So he's there as a peg to hold you down. We are being used as a peg hopefully to keep China down. Yeah. Yeah. That's how the is the is played in, in, yeah. in politics. In you in your um book you write uh, very beautifully that nobody ever talks about Christian national government, like right? Christian nationalist government, yeah. because somehow Christianity and democracy are supposed to be um you know going they go very well with each other. We know I that's not true. 
and western civilization it's it's a civilization yeah. aspect ha so they go very well with each other but india mein now suddenly there is this thing about hindu nationalist government so i asked them when did india not have a hindu nationalist government i mean um, yeah. indira gandhi was she not a hindu nationalist she was a, she was a hindu and she was a nationalist i would like to believe then yeah. was she, why was she not called a hindu nationalist you know or um, yes, so my question is that where why is it what is the problem with hinduism what is their problem with hinduism is it that this is a pagan religion and they don't understand it or is it that they think that um this could be in future this could be a challenge how, how do you keep india under control yeah it's a democracy yeah the largest it holds elections on the appointed you know every 5 years yeah those and takeovers are orderly mm-hmm. there is a free press it can say what it likes whatever these guys might say yeah huh mm-hmm. so what is it it's it's poor relatively speaking but we are, we're getting out of that so how do you keep india in control yeah look at it from their point of view There's this China, an economic giant, and India, an emerging economic giant. And if there were three states, one in Moscow, one in Beijing, one in New Delhi, imagine the triangulation. Mm-hmm. Okay, you don't want that to happen. You don't want to think about it. Yeah. You couldn't prevent China from getting where it got, but surely you can try and prevent India from becoming a problem for them. Yeah. So how do you attack it? You can't attack it by force. You can't use military power. You got to, you got to undermine the system. Yeah. You got to undermine the base, the majority. Yeah. That's. It's organized. Yeah. Now, majority continues to vote in a majority fashion. Hmm. Votes, even a democracy, they go by majority, not by religion. They do not go by caste. They go by uh, by the votes of the majority. Yeah. yeah. So they see inevitability of the continuation of the present system unless it is weakened. Absolutely. We've almost reached the end of this, but I have. There are people watching, Mr. Sooth, and they're asking questions. A lot of young people have joined today. and um i have a question from a young person he says in india especially in metropolitan cities the youth has become almost completely disconnected with india's cultural roots in many instances many of them even find it backwardly to follow indian traditions as cool enough to uh, and they think western culture is the coolest one is it a natural change of a consequence of a narrative does it have further consequence for india as a nation i think what he wants to ask is that the fact that we find the western things more attractive is it the consequence of a narrative that was thrown on, upon us i would like to think that this is a phase that we all go through in life okay this is you know being young and modern so you got to people find it very uh, very with it or being very normal by by addressing me and by my first name i don't like it i mean i a 20 year old fellow talking to me in my first name this is not indian yeah but this is western probably yeah okay right. so after a few years they'll grow out of this they will understand yeah. part of that will happen that part of them would stick to this the large majority will revert to being indians yeah and and it also depends on what not just what we see on tv or what our houses in what we teach our children in our houses mm. if we don't teach them values if we teach them that woh theek hai to fir that's how it will be so it's not just what we see or watch that matters it's what we are being exposed to what are told at school and at home how our parents behave that we yeah. imbibe from them yeah but i also think that you know it may be true in the west in in the let's say big metropolitan cities that you have this 
real cool guys roaming around uh, and, and girls uh, behaving very westernized, modern as they call it. Mm. But it's the B-town oh. is the real India today. Mm. That's where real India is growing. Mm. You can see it even in sports. You can see it in your civil service exams. You can see it yeah. in the kind of boys who, girls who join uh, big companies. They don't mm. all come from privileged, privileged homes or, or they, they, they work their way. Yeah. So it's interesting you say that because you and I went to the same college, St. Stephen's College, and yes. that was once the hub of that is where yeah. the entire civil yeah. services, you know, it was it was the move for civil services to come up from. Not anymore. Not, Not anymore. anymore. Not, Not anymore. anymore. It's totally changed. As you said, it's coming from the B towns. Even your cricket team doesn't come from Bombay and uh, Delhi anymore. Yeah. They yeah. don't they don't care if they can't speak English. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So you think yeah, we get there. We, yeah. we, so we should let this cultural phase go on. It's it's nice. That's where we are. we can absorb all this. Yeah. But, uh, that, that's where it's coming from. Yeah. 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 It is. It is important. Um, uh, one. I, I just have time for one. I'm going, going over, but there is one large um, uh, thing that um, have consecutive Indian governments underestimated the genocide of Kashmiri pundits with respect to building a strong global narrative on Kashmir and expose jihad as a war form. I have written this many times. In fact, I wrote an article also about how America and um, um, India can can really be allies in fighting terror if America wanted to, because we're the only ones who have fought jihad, really, and have been fighting it till now. We've been fighting the Islamist jihad till now. Do you not think that showcasing the story of the genocide of Kashmiri pundits is the way to um, uh, sort of, you know, talk about, to counter international, um, you know, this whole thing about jihad? Because jihad has a lot of uh, sympathizers. Yeah. Yeah. But I, 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 I am of the, of the view that if you have to tell our story, mm. we will tell it our way. Yeah. And we will tell it repeatedly mm. in different places, in different ways, different medium. Ultimately, the message will go home, but it won't go home with one. Uh, one GOI memorandum. Mm. You know, a lot, a lot of us have to do this. Yeah. Uh, kind of uh, well, well produced, mm. serious documentaries that show the the wrong that was done, the, yeah. the connivance that was there, mm. the weaknesses of the system. Yeah that allowed this to happen. Our inability to be tough when we needed to be tough. Mm. A lot of it is our own fault. Yeah. I mean, the rest of the world doesn't really care at the end of the day. How many people bother about what happened to the uh, refugees that go from Syria to, to Germany? And look how Afghanistan's story has completely disappeared. Nobody's no. talking about Afghanistan anymore. And, um, you know, it is uh, for, for about a week or two after this thing, we talked about how women are still not going to school in Afghanistan. Women have still not been given any rights in Afghanistan. The um, Taliban are coming down heavily on personal freedoms. But nobody, it's not the news anymore. Nobody's talking about it. Ukraine is taking over. And mind you, they will, they will strike a deal with the Taliban one day yeah. Yeah. and go into trade and business to save Afghanistan from the Chinese yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So this so, is a cynical world. This you is a cynical that? world. It's all very nice to say, say noble things in, in drawing rooms. And yeah. Write noble essays. But that's not how it is. It's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a very harsh world. It's a very harsh world, truly. And we are setting this with the, um, uh, you know, 
at least we can start by understanding what it is. That is the thing. We have to understand we what we are only yes. then can we counter it. And I think your book is a seminal work in that sense because you give us a chance. I don't know how 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 hard you must have worked and how you slept while working the book because your mind must have been buzzing with all these patterns that you were drawing for us because i know when i read it the second time the first time i read it 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 all it opened my eyes but the second time when i read it it just I, all those things that i had missed the first time came out and then my mind was buzzing and I couldn't sleep for a while because I kept thinking, oh, that is what it was. How did we not know about it? So I think your book sets a good understanding because once we understand what is going on, only then can we mount a narrative or then can we mount a reply. If we don't understand what is going on, there is no, you know, then we are just like anywhere, just like cattle being you know, take it away. So we can't uh, end it. Thank you so much, Mr. Sood, for being with me. And this has been such an informative um, uh, session. There are a lot of people who've watched it today and I'm my phone is buzzing already with all the messages that I'm going. I would like to tell everyone who has been uh, watching this, go get this book, The Ultimate <laughs> Go buy this book. What we have talked about is not even 2% of what Mr. Sood writes in that and what Mr. Sood explains in that book. There's only so much one can do in the one hour show. But go read that book and talk to me, write to me. I am, you know, where to find me. And we can, if you have more questions, I can help them send those to you to Mr. Sood. And we can, um, we can keep the conversation going because that is the whole point about Epicenter. That is the whole point about doing this show. We need to keep the um, conversation going. There is a, a quote that I have written here from uh, Mr. Sood's book. And it says, the ultimate goal of any power and ultimate goal of any power is seeking global dominance and that can only be do, done by setting the narrative their own narrative not the narrative that comes from abroad not the narrative that is given to you not the narrative and india as a country it's a civilizational power we have can tell our stories better than us. We have so many stories to tell. We have been um, our uh, ancient traditions, of course, but also our history. You know, our history provides us with so many interesting stories that we can tell the world and we can set our narrative. And we have been, you know, we've not, we've reached somewhere, we've not succeeded yet, but we will get there. We'll get there one day. That is the hope. Thank you so much, Mr. Sood, for joining us. And do follow Epicenter and um, on all the handles on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And um, you know where to find me. I'm on Twitter and you know my handles. If you have any questions or any guests that you would like us to talk to, I would be happy to take all those requests. And be well, keep reading, and watch Epicenter next week. This is Sunanda Vashisht signing off.